the office, uh, the setting get uh, distracted. So good morning and good afternoon and good evening and welcome to the second day of the ninth statistical forum. We had yesterday quite an interesting day and I personally learned a lot from the interesting presentation we saw yesterday. And I really look forward to another exciting day today. We will start today with a session on international effort to measure the impact of climate change. Gabriel Quiroz Romero will kick off the session with the presentation of the IMF Climate Indicator Dashboard. We have learned, we have heard about that uh, yesterday and it was launched in April last this year in close collaboration with other international organizations and institutions. Following its presentation, uh, we will have a panel discussion on key issue in measuring climate change in macroeconomic statistics, where we will discuss the ongoing effort to enhance the availability and accessibility of relevant climate change data to support policy decisions. We will end the session with a short survey. So without further ado, uh, let me give the floor to Gabriel to present the dashboard and the update that we have made that his, he and his team has made since April before we go to the panel discussion. Gabriel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Louis Marc. After this nice video, my task of uh, trying to reflect uh, the extraordinary work of uh, an extraordinary team at the Statistics Department in close cooperation with other international organizations is even, is even more difficult. Uh, let me add to the introductory remarks uh, uh, from Louis Marc that uh, this dashboard, uh, IMF Climate Change Indicator Dashboard, has a number of very salient, uh, salient uh, and prominent aspects. The first I would like to underline is that it's an experimental. It's not yet uh, official statistics, and they reflect research and development in a statistics in, clo in close cooperations of the uses for this type of data. The second element remark I would like to make is that it leverage on the, the extraordinary previous work uh, uh, made by uh, a number of international organizations on methodology and data sources. Therefore, as Lima has said, I would like also to stress the cooperation with international organizations. Without that cooperation and without a pre-existing work, this uh, rapidly constructed uh, dashboard of the IMF because of the urgency of the matter uh, has, would have not been possible. Let me also say that uh, one element which differentiates uh, the set of indicators that we have in our dashboard is that focus on uh, economic and financial dimensions of climate change, which are closer to the core mandate of the IMF. In this respect, we try to, uh, to avoid as much as possible the overlap with other international organizations given their respective mandate. Let me also stress that, and this is a fundamental element of this uh, set of indicators, that is demand-driven. This uh, dashboard has been uh, built up and developed in the last uh, almost two years now, in close consultations, in particular with the users' departments of the IMF. 
being in the IMF, the area departments, the country desk, and the functional departments. Without their feedback and their constructive uh, um, comments, uh, this uh, dashboard would not look like uh, what it is uh, now. And finally, uh, let me say that it's a living dash, uh, dashboard. Uh, it's, a, it's a living dashboard. We have started to work in January uh, last year, and actually a lot of work ahead is in front of us, as I will try to uh, uh, indicate at the end of this presentation. Uh, even so, uh, last but not least, let me say that uh, I have the honor of presenting the extraordinary immense work of the Statistics Department, but also other departments, as I have mentioned, in the IMF, and uh, privileged the cooperation with the international organizations. Now, um, the, the dashboard. The dashboard actually tried to tell, uh, because of the focus on economic and financial dimensions, economic and financial story. Basically, we have at uh, the center uh, the fact that climate, and there is a change in climate. And uh, this climate uh, change is actually in part uh, produced, in part, triggered by uh, economic activity in general and government policies. So in this respect, the climate, uh, uh, and the climate change dashboard organize the set of indicators in five categories. Today, we are presenting the fifth category. In five categories, which is basically on economic activity, focus on the production, how the production, how the technology, how the different uh, raw materials are producing more or less C, uh, greenhouse emissions. For an institution like the IMF, cannot be otherwise that we connect production in, the, in, the, in, a, in a given economy to the global picture, to the uh, global uh, demand. And for that, it, this dashboard put particular emphasis in cross-border uh, indicators and cross-border dimension that probably is a salient feature of this uh, set of indicators at the IMF compared to other uh, set of indicators. Um, third, from a still economic and financial perspective, we have to think about how the financial system actually is channeling financing to one type of activities or others to one type of uh, of energy sources or others. And for that, we have a set of indicators, which are financial indicators from a macro perspective, only a macro perspective. We don't enter into the micro perspective or market perspective. And of course, related uh, to the uh, financial system, there are a number of uh, indicators, physical risk and other indicators Certainly, natural disasters is one of the most salient elements, which are very close to the economic and financial dimensions, given the impact, in particular, on the fiscal position and the financial stability or the, the stability of uh, the financial system in a number of countries which are affected by climate change. Finally, uh, the fourth economic story is how governments react. Uh, and of course, the, the government have the possibility of reacting uh, to this. Uh, uh, to these uh, economic and financial developments. Uh, and uh, we all do that in the context of climate, uh, uh, of, of key elements uh, of climate change, like sea levels increase or increase in temperatures and so on and so forth. So there are basically five categories which are uh, organized in 23 indicators and 165 data sets. Um, already mentioned, collaboration of other institutions. And then the timeline I have already mentioned as well, we are started in January 20 and now uh, we are now having an enhancement of the dashboard which was released for the first time in the uh, World Bank IMF spring meetings in April. Uh, we are, have been clustering the changes since April to now in this release, which is now live as we speak. And a lot of work is going forward. One of the main milestones ahead of us from a purely statistical perspective is the revision of the system of national accounts and balance of payments, annual, annual expected in 25. Um, basically, uh, the developments for those who uh, are aware or uh, aware of what we did in April, basically, is the fifth category, uh, which 
we thought it is important that we contextualize uh, the climate change data with uh, a salient number of purely climate climate uh, uh, change information, not necessarily economic and financial information, and this is the fifth category. We have, therefore, uh, restructured and added this fifth category. We introduced additional uh, indicators. I mentioned before, we have now uh, a higher number of indicators than in April, and we have updated, enhanced some of the existing indicators already released in April. And very important from an IMF perspective, we are increasing, which is one of the critical elements of the development, the increases of the country coverage. Going to the economic and financial indicators. As I have mentioned already, the economic and financial indicators are focus on uh, the uh, basically on the greens and green gas emissions in this uh, set of indicators we have uh, um, the inventories the national greenhouse uh, gas emissions inventories and the national my, uh, mitigation targets we also in cooperation with the OECD international um, um, agency uh, for Energy, we have developed uh, quarterly greenhouse and gas emissions by activity and for households. And we have also developed, uh, in cooperation with other international organizations and based on the, partly on the existing uh, information available, databases available worldwide, CO2 emissions per unit of output. The estimates in this uh, area of indicators are by industry. The national uh, greenhouse gas emission inventories record the annual amount of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere by the source of the emission. National mitigations emission targets reflect an estimation, they are an estimation by IMF staff of what is, has been submitted, which is not always normalized to the uh, unit uh, to the uh, uh, to the united nations the so called national determined contributions as per paris climate agreement and they have actually back uh, um, um, back series they started in 19 and they have projection up to 2035 in terms of the targets the co2 emissions per unit of airport reflect the amount of carbon dioxide from fuel combustion, combustion emitted into the atmosphere from the production from the production direct production and indirect uh, uh, contributions from production in terms of the production chain per year per unit of output these indicators will permit the cid uh, 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 users to identify those industries and those countries where adjustment to low carbon or non carbon technologies are most urgent. A couple of examples of what I have just said now with uh, some charts. Uh, targets. Uh, you have, we have uh, here, as I have mentioned, the national determined targets. And you can see here that uh, in the, on the right side, uh, in a round blue uh, point here, uh, you have the uh, you have the targets for um, the target as per Paris Agreement for 2030. Uh, and then, uh, as you can see, uh, this graph is, um, in fact, uh, displays the worldwide uh, emissions targets, 2030. And they, these targets are 10% below the 2018 levels, right? Um, the, uh, however, the uh, 2030 targets is higher than what would be needed to achieve a limit of warming in two uh, uh, degrees Celsius. So the targets are stretching and actually the projection, if business is uh, going as usual, which is the orange uh, line, a straight line on top, means that we all we will overshoot, the world will overshoot the targets, the worldwide targets in 2030, which again, I should insist, they are already insufficient to contend at uh, 1.5 or two Celsius degrees, uh, the, world, the global warming. We have developed uh, uh, with other international organizations, as mentioned, quarterly greenhouse emissions. Why? And this quarterly greenhouse is basically based on uh, 
um, is anchored on quarterly uh, national accounts and quarterly uh, GDP in particular, and actually allows us to increase the timeliness of the estimated annual uh, emissions because the uh, lead times the lack uh, so far is around two years. So basically we have only uh, annual for 2018, uh, 2019 in some cases with a quarterly extrapolation, we actually bring closer the, what is going on now to what is uh, uh, to, to our data in 21, as I said, based on quarterly national accounts. As you can see from the blue line, which is the quarterly emissions estimated, the fit with the uh, when you go backwards uh, with the the fit with the annual is actually quite good. So we can we trust that the projections, or actually the real time projection that we are doing in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse uh, emissions through the quarterly frequency gives us a good impression of what is going on. And you can see here a little bit of uh, of a dip uh, in uh, obviously uh, um, um, uh, on the right of the of the blue line, which uh, responds uh, obviously to less uh, economic, less production, and less CO2 emission due to the pandemic uh, uh, lockdown. Um, another important indicator, which is, uh, is the CO2 emissions per industry and per country. I think this is one of the indicators that from an economic point of view is a lot of hints for policy making. In particular, we can see, for example, in these charts, how the uh, electricity water waste industry actually is the main contributor to greenhouse emissions in all countries uh, with no distinction. At the same time, differences across countries are very prominent. For example, in the, while they are not very prominent, uh, sorry, or they are less prominent maybe in agriculture, but they are very prominent in electricity, water, and waste industry, with uh, China uh, being uh, the uh, country uh, producing more CO2 emissions per unit of output compared to the US or France. The reason obviously is that the source of the electricity um, in particular in these countries is very different. The technology is very different, while in the case of China is, uh, uh, is uh, still very much uh, based on coal. Uh, the, in the case of France, for example, is in nuclear power. And therefore the CO2 emissions resulting are less and the US something in between. Now, this is, uh, now we need uh, the uh, global perspective. It's really important to have the global perspective. Is, this is not an issue of global warming just from the production side. It's not a country-based uh, issue. Uh, uh, some countries produce, produce certain products that actually can only be produced if they are demanded by other countries. And therefore, we need to have the cross-border implications here. Uh, the cross-border indicators are organized in two groups, one trade-related, another direct investment-related. I will not mention anything about direct investment-related indicators because yesterday my colleagues, Maria Borga and colleagues, actually made a fantastic presentation and they explained you in detail the direct investment-related indicators. I will say a little bit about trade-related indicators, which are, we have three indicators under this uh, category. Uh, well, one is CO2 emissions embodied in, in domestic final demand, uh, production and trade. Another one is trade in environmental goods. And the third one, trade in low carbon technology products. Just a little bit of, a, of a, an impression of what we mean by CO2 emissions embodied in trade. Here we have in this chart, the case of exports in China and import in China. The uh, dotted uh, uh, darker line is the gross exports of China's, of China's, and they reflect, uh, they reflect uh, the embodied uh, CO2 emissions in those exports. The orange is what is actually the CO2 emissions embodied in the imports from other countries. The result, is, uh, the result of this is obviously the current account balance you want of in the CO2 emissions terms, which is uh, the lines in, uh, in blue. 
what is clear here is that uh, uh, China is uh, is having uh, is uh, exporting uh, is exporting has uh, uh, is a net uh, exported of uh, of CO2 emissions. However, we need to reflect why this is the case. Well, the case is because there is a demand for those exports, which are um, are consumed in other countries, the rest of the world, and in particular in the U.S. So that means that uh, there is an, an element of production, in this case of exports, and there is an element of imp, uh, of uh, of uh, uh, demand, final demand, uh, uh, households, but also investment and so on and so forth. So that means that there is a global responsibility from the production and the final demand side. And I think this uh, chart uh, provides us with a, a, nice, uh, a nice way of looking at it. Another indicator which uh, is being in particular developed uh, since April, uh, although we have already, but uh, we have uh, made more efforts, is environmental goods, which are defined to include environmentally connected goods whose use directly service serve in environmental protection purposes, such as catalytic converters and environmental adapted goods whose use is beneficial for environment, environmental protection, such as hybrid and electric cars. The indicators are based on data from the UN Comtrade. These maps show the share of environmental goods in total imports for countries for which data are available in 2018. And as we can see, there is a, a wide range uh, between 0.2% uh, and 17.6% of uh, uh, total imports from environmental goods. So the higher the percentage, the more those countries importing this, uh, those goods are consuming and investing in environmental goods through imports. As I mentioned, I will not refer to the foreign direct investment because it was very well explained yesterday. Now, the third category is the financial and risk indicators. And here, the financial risk indicators, we try to reach to the extraordinary work done by other, other international organizations. And uh, the, the network for, uh, for uh, green financial system is one of those, uh, those uh, obvious references the work of the Financial Stability Board, the work of central banks, and so on and so forth. But we still want to provide to our users, uh, just in this platform of our dashboard, some indicators that we think are particularly relevant and for ease of use. Sometimes we import them, we take it from others, from other publications. We organize, obviously, in financial indicators and risk indicators, being uh, the risk indicator, transition risk, physical risk. Yesterday, uh, colleagues from the ECB, Caroline, and others uh, made a lot of uh, uh, an excellent presentation on physical risks, and they are working on this. So central banks, obviously, from the financial perspective, in particular, are looking into this uh, matter. Here in the financial indicators, we in the task force, we really try to make as much as possible the link uh, with climate change to the, our existing monetary, financial, and finance soundness indicators. And we do this with an attempt of producing uh, an in house a carbon footprint adjusted loans to total loans for deposit takers. We take from outside, uh, tort, uh, from commercial. Uh, commercial uh, uh, data providers, green bonds, and from others, non-life insurance penetration. As I said, we just stop in the macro perspective. Let me say something about the carbon footprint uh, adjusted loans to total loans. As you can see here in this chart, uh, they, uh, there's a big uh, variety, a big uh, difference in terms of, uh, of uh, across countries. This uh, indicator captures the carbon intensity of domestic loans. In other words, how the bank loans are being addressed or are being directed to activities which are more, more uh, greenhouse emissions emis uh, emitting or less. And this is actually what we have here. There is the variety across countries is very immense, obviously reflecting, as cannot be otherwise, the reality of the uh, production investment in this respective countries and the economic structure 
which is more uh, towards uh, um, emitting, uh, emitting CO2 or less emitting CO2. I think this obviously, uh, um, these uh, indicators built on the indicators that we have in the group one and the group two in particular. For the green uh, bonds, I think it's quite, quite well known. And uh, of course, we can see here just a, a big increase in the issuance of green bonds. However, there are a number of issues like the classification of uh, and these uh, green bonds where they are really green. And there is uh, actually also um, an issue that, uh, although this is a, a strong increase in the last years, however, uh, still they are only a marginal part of the total issuance of bonds in the different sector, being the, the non-financial corporations, the financial corporations, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, uh, something that, however, it, it, is it, it is interesting, it is always referred, and we take it from a, a commercial data provider, uh, reflective. We also, given the importance for uh, to keep in the radar, in the front of uh, our indicator for our, in particular, area departments, uh, um, the uh, risks uh, coming uh, from, uh, from, from climate, uh, for in particular, for low-income countries and uh, fragile states, we uh, take, uh, uh, basically, uh, simply take uh, the uh, indicators uh, produced by the European Commission, and we only adjust that indicator by excluding earthquakes and concentrating only in natural disasters related to climate change or the way we see only those uh, those risks. As you can see here, very important from our, our, our bilateral surveillance in the IMF is that higher risk are in um, in a number of African countries. Is the red the higher the, the more red it is the higher is the risk in terms of climate-driven hazard and exposure, vulnerability, and also the uh, capacity uh, of these countries in order to withstand the effects of climate change in their economy and uh, more generally in their uh, population and, uh, and society. So this is, a, this is a something that uh, is, uh, again, thanks to the good work already produced by others, in this case, the European Commission. Government policies indicators is, uh, is uh, the, uh, we cannot, uh, if we really want to uh, hint at what are the government actions, poss uh, possible actions, we have to look into the taxes and the uh, government expenditure and uh, also subsidies. And this is the organization of this uh, dashboard. So we have, uh, uh, information taxes on energy, on transport, pollution, resources, and we have, based on COFOC, uh, information on environmental protection, and our Fiscal Affairs Department has provided excellent work on fiscal, on the, on the uh, subsidies, on fossil fuel subsidies, and there is a reference to observed explicit subsidies, but also estimated uh, uh, implicit fossil fuel subsidies uh, which take into account the negative externalities of using fuel in the countries. Very, very rapidly, because uh, uh, we, you can say here that the total environmental taxes in percent of GDP has been very stable in the last years, in 94, uh, in the last 20 years, and in a spate of, in principle, we would expect uh, that taxes have increased. Well, obviously, this is in terms of revenue, so there, there is a base uh, issue here, we will have actually uh, more, tax, more taxes and less, and less, uh, and less uh, 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 activity related to CO2 emissions or, or damage in the environment. But still, I think this gives not a very good uh, policy uh, conclusion about tax policies when it comes to climate change, because they have been very stable when it comes to the total revenue for environment. In terms of government expenditure, it's a very minor uh, environmental protection, as you can see here in this uh, pipe chart, is a very small part of, uh, of uh, the total, uh, uh, it's less than 1% of the total, uh, less percent, one percent of the GDP. Uh, so I guess uh, also on the government expenditure side, the governments could think of doing more. Um, 
Then in terms of finally, the, in terms of indicators, the, uh, this is, uh, as I said, we, the Fiscal Affairs Department has been uh, putting a lot of emphasis and, uh, and concentrating on the importance of looking at uh, the policies on subsidies. And uh, they have made uh, actually a publication which has been done, has been uh, issued very recently. And we take, uh, they uh, are contributing to this dashboard. And, Definitely, fossil for on a full uh, uh, full subsidies is one of the main problems that we have in terms of policies when it comes to uh, tackling uh, climate change from the government perspective. Uh, the fifth category I will not mention because uh, uh, of uh, the time, and uh, I have already uh, indicated that we contextualize uh, a number of key elements uh, in terms of temperatures, sea level, and so on and so forth. Last part of my presentation, I need to jump on this, given the, uh, is the future work. The future work is, is uh, extraordinary high. Uh, we can think of, uh, of uh, climate change statistics as uh, an incremental work to the existing macroeconomic statistics. However, the existing macroeconomic statistics have, de have been developed up in the last 50, 60, 70 years, depending on what indicators in the national accounts or balance of payment you look at. So I, we are, at least from the dashboard perspective, only started a couple of years ago. So a lot of our work has been done before. Obviously, we have had to been lucky enough that being a little bit late commerce, actually, we have leverage on the excellent work of a, num a, num a number of international organizations and existing databases. But definitely going forward, uh, in terms of climate change statistics, the main problem is that the current macroeconomic statistics to integrate climate change into the core framework is that uh, the current macroeconomic statistics were designed without having in front uh, the policy questions and the need pro to provide granular analysis for climate uh, change related economic and financial stabilities. This is the main problem. So actually, even if we go to the, to the existing, uh, to the existing uh, low uh, uh, breakdowns of the macroeconomic statistics, we will not find exactly what type of energy we are having, for example, we are having or the countries are, are, are producing. So we need to do something. And this is the main problem and the, and the, uh, and the main challenge, more specifically on the challenge and a little bit on the solutions to close my presentation. Uh, for example, the international standards industrial classification is a production oriented and groups producing units into industries based on similarities such as the characteristics of output or the technologies of production. Uh, our work in the dashboard has some, has some definitely drawbacks in using some of the existing classification. For, for example, the ISIC-4 classification currently doesn't differentiate between renewable and non-renewable energy production, where carbon intensities are completely different, obviously. Some environmental goods are not visible in the harmonized system uh, for classifying international trade statistics. For example, some components of wind turbines are classified, are classified under a code that includes other engines that are not related to wind power. Similarly, eco-friendly alternatives such as products made from recycled materials are often classif uh, classified in the HS, HS alongside the traditional products that they are intended to replace. So trade in these goods cannot be separately identified. So for example, in the chart that I presented before, maybe we are underestimating the environmental. Uh, developed in the, uh, the COFOC, obviously, the uh, um, classification of, gov of government expenditure doesn't, it has, uh, we, we, we leverage on the, on, the, uh, on the environmental protection. However, environmental protection is not one to one uh, uh, fitting to climate change. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, taxes, for example, uh, for example uh, and subsidies, uh, we are missing important tax uh, important policies like, for example, uh, government's tax reliefs on certain green activities. We don't have that. And this will be extremely important in order to inform policy making and compare policy, uh, government policies across countries. The solutions, well, the solution is to start to uh, try in the ISIC and the, in the central product classification, try to use the next update in order to come 
something closer to what we need in the climate change. In the short term, alternative uh, options uh, will need to be explored, such as expanding existing classi classification to identify items such as uh, uh, items which are relevant to climate change. For example, by identifying low carbon components of the electricity generation. In the medium term, the review of the, of the standards, of the manuals, the cooperation with other international organizations, in particular on a number of uh, indicators, including sustainable finance, carbon, food, carbon footprint of financial institution assets portfolios, with a view to expand it beyond loans and supporting the initiative and, uh, and the initiative and bridging existing taxonomies. I need to close here, uh, but uh, let me just uh, uh, say that uh, last but not last, uh, uh, last but not least, we hope that the new uh, G20 Data Gap Initiative will actually uh, provide a um, good momentum in order to provide uh, uh, to produce comparable data related to the economic and financial dimensions of climate change. Thank you very much, and apologies because I went through uh, and beyond my time. Thank you. Many thanks, Gabriel, for a very rich presentation and a very impactful video. Uh, as you mentioned, the dashboard is a product of collaborative effort between our partners and other institutions. And uh, in your last slide, you really demonstrated and underlined that there's a lot of work ahead of us uh, to improve the data availability, in particular in terms of uh, methodology, taxonomy for data collection, and uh, to respond to the data new needs. So uh, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very nice presentation. I think now it's a good segue to to focus now on our panel discussion this morning, and uh, we are joined by representative of some of our key partners institution, and we're very fortunate to have such an impressive lineup of panelists. So let me quickly introduce them to you. Uh, our first panelist, uh, Nathalie Giroir is head of Division of Environmental Performance and Information in the OECD Environment Directorate. She oversees the Environmental Performance Review Program, the development of work on environmental information and indicators, and the OECD Fossil Fuel Support Intelligence Unit. Previously, she coordinated the OECD work on green growth and sustainable development and oversaw the mainstreaming of green growth within the OECD country surveillance exercise. Welcome, Natalie. Our second panelist, Stefan Halligate, is Senior Climate Change Advisor of the World Bank Climate Change Group. He joins the World Bank in 2012 after 10 years of academic research. He was a lead author of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and he's also authors of dozens of articles published in international journals in multiple disciplines and on several in of several books. So welcome, Stefan. Our third panelist, Nick Johnstone, took his duty as chief statistician and head of Energy Data Center of the International Energy Agency in February 2019. Previously, he provided support to the work of the Committee on Industry, Innovation and Entrepreneurship in the Director of Science, Technology and Innovation at the OECD. Before joining the OECD, Nick was a research associate at the International Institute for Environmental and Development. Welcome, Nick. Our fourth panelist, Deborah Revoltea, is the Director of the Economic Department of the European Investment Bank. Serving as Chief Economist since uh, April 2011, she's also a member of the Steering Committee of the Vienna Initiative and the CompNet and a member of the board of the Joint Vienna Institute and the Euro 50 Group. Welcome, Deborah. Our fifth panelist, Rina Shah, is the chief of the Environment Statistics Section of the United Nations Statistics Division. She is responsible for the development of methodological work on environment statistics, as well as global data collection and dissemination of environmental statistics. She's also responsible for the development of global set of climate change statistics and indicators that will be submitted to the United Nations Statistical Commission in 2022 for adoption during its 53rd session. Welcome, Rina. Our sixth uh, and final panelist, Valiuna Tellucci, 
is Deputy Director of the IMF Monetary Capital Market Department with responsibility for the fund global financial market monitoring and systemic risk assessment. His responsibility include the Global Financial Stability Report that gives the IMF assessment of global financial stability risk. And prior to joining the IMF, Fabio was a Senior Associate Director in the Division of Monetary Affairs at the Federal Reserve Board. Welcome, Fabio. So welcome to all. We uh, have a fabulous uh, panel, and I want to remind the audience that uh, we will they will have a chance to ask questions to the speaker at the end of the session, so you, you can pose your question in the chat as we go along. For the panelists, uh, I remind you that uh, we have a few questions and uh, try to limit your answer to two to four minutes so that we can have enough time to uh, go through the question of the of the participant. With that, uh, let me give you my first question. Uh, we heard yesterday that climate change is a global challenge and that international cooperation is a condition of sine qua non, which was also highlighted again at the recent COP26 summit. We also heard that we had already established several mechanisms and governance group to work on climate related data. At the same time, we heard a call for the development of a conceptual framework, uniform methodology to think about climate change indicators and policy. So my question in this context, from where you stand in your domain of expertise and your institution, what would you see as the main priority and how do you want to get there? And perhaps we start with Natalie. Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louis Marc, and uh, thank you for uh, this fabulous uh, presentation and uh, video uh, that uh, you showed us at the, at the beginning. Very inspiring. Congratulations uh, to you and Gabriel and your team. It's, um, it's uh, really a, a nice view. Um, those are very important questions, and um, I think that uh, the, the idea of having a conceptual framework and having a uniform uh, methodology for climate change indicators are really two key in ingredients uh, for developing authoritative reference uh, in the area of uh, monitoring uh, climate policy, and also uh, to uh, set the stage for a, a, a global strategic vision uh, that would uh, be necessary for a narrative to uh, to move and help uh, countries uh, as they develop their uh, net zero strategies and we accompany them as uh, international organizations. And in this area, I think that uh, the OECD work is uh, very complementary to uh, the work that the IMF has been uh, doing over the past couple of, uh, of years. And uh, we have also our, our dashboard as part of our international program for action uh, initiative, and uh, we have also developed a conceptual framework behind that, which is the pressure state and response model. And uh, this model integrates uh, the topics that are covered in the assessment of the uh, IPCC and uh, are used in the uh, United Nations Statistical Division and the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Europe indicator frameworks. We also uh, look at the synergies uh, with uh, the IMF uh, climate change indicator dashboard, which, which we, we cooperate uh, again. Um, and all this is important because we want to make sure that our dashboard is different and complementary uh, to the indicators that are already used in other fora. And the question of duplication of work between IOs is something that is sensitive and we should be um, alerted to that. Um, the monitoring of, uh, of our work at the OECD is based on the, the three areas, so the pressure, the state, and the response. And we have translated that into three key questions. So the first question that we uh, ask is, how far are countries from achieving national and global climate objectives? And to answer this question, we use pressure indicators, so greenhouse gas emission trends, trajectories, uh, greenhouse gas emission structure and intensities. Then the second question related to the state is how vulnerable are countries to climate impact and risk? And uh, to answer these questions, we look at the climate related impact on environmental conditions. A little bit like you have also uh, showed there, we try to 
identify what would be the adaptation needs by looking at weather related impacts, temperature anomaly, extreme weather events, for instance. And then the third set of questions is how advanced is country climate action in response to the net zero challenge? And there are response indicators looked at actions and opportunity, um, climate uh, related pricing, taxation, uh, climate related innovation indicators, and also other policy response and socioeconomic opportunities. So this is how we um, are uh, building our, our work. Of course, uh, like the IMF, this is work in progress and we will be uh, working with you and other IOs, we hope further in the future to enhance and extend the data and the methodology together. We have also identified some placeholders uh, for a few highly desirable indicators that might be included in future editions and those related to climate related budgets, expenditure, uh, adaptation measures and labor market opportunity arising from uh, climate action. Thank you, Natalie. And I think a lot of your work is quite complementary to the dashboard that Gabriel has just presented, especially in terms of reliability and uh, climate budget. Let me turn now to Stefan. Stefan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation, and thanks for your work uh, and the presentation of the of the dashboard. Uh, we really welcome uh, this this work, and uh, and uh, we also appreciate that we were. Uh, discussing about your dashboard already a long time ago. So your, your team reached out to us and we, we had a few discussions uh, along the development, which uh, which we uh, we appreciated. And we, we like also to see that some of the uh, the, the data that we, we produced uh, have been used in, in your dashboard. So I think it's a good example of, of our collaboration. Um, you, you're asking about um, consistency, cooperation, and I think this is this is really important because at the end of the day, we're talking to the same people in in governments and civil society and and uh, private sector. Uh, so of course they don't want to see very different things using completely different framework. At the same time, there is clearly a, a trade-off because this is all new. We're all learning, and we clearly don't want to just impose a straitjacket too early before we experiment. So I think the the discussions that we're having today, but that we had in the past and we continue to have, is really important to just manage this trade-off that we, we want to arrive with consistent signals and tools, and at the same time, uh, not to force a, a unique framework on, on everything too early. Um, we, as you know, we're starting to do country diagnostics, uh, the, the country climate and development reports. Um, and we have done a lot of work on, on data and scenarios in that context. Uh, one of the challenge we have is that there are a lot of global databases uh, with some data, some indicators, and there is work at the country level. And those numbers are not always the same. Uh, if you go with the global databases, the strength is you can benchmark, you can compare. At the same time, very often we have country level data, which is of higher quality and granularity. And so I think this is a question for all of those dashboards, how to manage uh, this, again, this trade-off between comparability, but, uh, but also using the, the, best, the best possible data. Um, in terms of dashboards and Everybody's talking about their own dashboard. So let me just mention that we, we have the, the climate change knowledge portal, which is focusing on, on climate scenarios, like the change in temperature and precipitation and so on, which is a specially resolved data sets. And we have created the CCDR data bank, which is uh, maybe closer to what you just presented with the socioeconomic uh, information. Uh, we have a little framework looking at emissions and mitigation, looking at adaptation and risks, and then a cross-cutting um, um, block with the, all of the tools countries have to manage a, a transition. And just three things that I think we have to just keep in mind is when we do benchmarking of countries, uh, there is a question of whether we want to compare countries with their peers or against targets. And in a world where nobody is really on track with the two degree or 1.5 targets, of course, comparing countries not on track is not always very useful. So it's useful to bring the targets, but it's very politically sensitive. So I think this is an important discussion we, we might have. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to mention was the gray area between data and models. So uh, Gabriel, you, you, you mentioned the fact that sometimes you have to do a lot of ex-post processing. And there is, to me, a big question of 
how do we explain what we did and make the difference between things that we really observe back in the in the world and things that require so much post-processing that it brings a lot of uncertainty and we have to be very careful in how we, we present that information. So a lot of work in front of us and very happy to continue this, uh, this conversation. Thank you. Many thanks, Stefan. I think uh, you're bringing very important point, especially on the, how do we trade off the uh, aggregate data, which are in those dashboard with the granularity that we may get from uh, country work, as well as uh, what kind of benchmark we want to use. I mean, that would change substantially the kind of policy implication that you have. So thank you so much for bringing this. Uh, let me ask uh, Nick to be next. Nick, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Louis Marc, and thank you to Gabrielle for the excellent uh, presentation. Congratulations on all the, all the great work that's uh, that's been done already. Um, I mean, a point has been made about the importance of, of complementarity of mandates, and in a way, at the IEA, we've got a little bit of an easier role because our mandate is quite quite narrow, and as a function of that, it allows us then, I think, to to do complementary work with 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 all the other uh, international governmental organisations in order to. Um, to make sure that uh, the energy side is, is, is well reflected. Uh, and so you won't be surprised to hear that you know, I'll focus my response on specifically the, 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 energy, the energy space. Um, and actually, I have to say, quite frankly, personally, uh, you know, our, one of our core products is the generation of energy balances globally for most countries in the world. And uh, initially, I didn't fully understand just how valuable that was for policymakers. Uh, but now I've come to understand that. And the reason is because in many cases, our countries are not actually introducing first best policies or second best policies. It's a very complicated mix of policies, which to my mind require a deep representation of the energy systems. Uh, and without that, then it makes it difficult for us to see the effects of the more heterogeneous policies that we're putting in place and the impacts that they ultimately have. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we've been working for many years developing energy balances uh, across the globe, and we have a, a very good coverage, and it's improving all the time, but it's still a work in progress. Uh, and it's a work in progress for a few reasons. First of all, uh, because we need to be able to track technological and market developments, and, and Gabrielle alluded to this to, a, to, a, to when he was discussing the question of, of classifications. And this needs to be reflected in the kind of data that we collect. I'll just give a few examples. Hydrogen is going to grow in importance, but the way in which we are capturing that is not in our systems, in our data systems, is not necessarily uh, sufficient in order to get an idea of what's happening. Same thing with decentralized PV, solar uh, photovoltaics. Uh, the whole question is about grids, distribution losses, those kinds of things. This is the data we, we need, and we need to go out of our way to try and collect that kind of data. Secondly, not all energy uh, uh, that is generated and used is actually reflected in market transactions. So the physical nature of our balances uh, provides information that is not necessarily reflected in market transaction data, which I think is, is very complementary with the work of, of other uh, organizations. And then finally, of course, not all energy inputs are combusted and the, not all the combusted energy is emitted uh, as uh, pollutions emitted them. And so we need to think about all of that and capture that in a representation of the energy system. But even if we do that, it's not enough. And that's where complementary, complementarity matters. We need to be able to link all of that with economic systems. Uh, and so I'll just mention one piece of work that we're doing at the moment, uh, which is trying to link our, the energy balances of the, of the IEA, the national physical representation of energy systems, with uh, inter-country input-output tables that are generated by colleagues of Natalie's at the OECD. Because that then lets us marry, sort of the, the in a hybrid sense, uh, all of this information that we see in the economy with what we see in physical terms, in terms of the engineering of our energy systems. Uh, it's not an easy job to do, but we're in the first stages of it. But why I think it's particularly important uh, is because, for the very reason I mentioned at the outset, because our policies are not simple policies like a tax. We have taxes. Yes, of course we have taxes. But even when we have taxes, they have narrow incidents where they have many features about which have rather peculiar consequences on the manner in which we generate and use energy. Uh, and we have a lot of regulations. Uh, and the manner in which that can be reflected in our energy systems, is reflected in our energy systems, uh, requires careful thought, but requires a deep understanding of the nature of that system. So by marrying the two sets of data together, 
I think we can start to get towards something which helps us uh, bring together uh, the, 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 the physical world, so to speak, with the economic world, ultimately to have a better idea of, of climate change impacts. Thank you so much, Nick. I think what you're uh, bringing to the conversation is the importance of linking the physical measurement with uh, the economic uh, measurement. And there's a huge literature in economic on externalities, which also has a lot of uh, impact for policy. So, uh, so I'm glad that you're already mixing your energy balance with the OECD input output models. I think that's the first uh, first step to do that direction. So thanks, thanks for bringing that, uh, that element in the conversation. Let me now turn to Deborah. Deborah, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start uh, congratulating uh, again, uh, like uh, all the other uh, speakers on uh, the dashboard. I think uh, what uh, you have presented is impressive and the advancement that you have done are really, really critical. And as well, uh, the working program that uh, you have, you were the pitching is uh, very much uh, spot on. And uh, what I would like to add in the discussion is uh, briefly explaining uh, where uh, where uh, we are coming from, uh, from the European Investment Bank standpoint, and then uh, what are the key priorities uh, that we see um, going uh, forward. Uh, where we are coming from is uh, that uh, the institution has been uh, the first MDB to be uh, Paris aligned uh, in all our activities uh, since uh, 2020. And uh, as part of the process, uh, we have also gone uh, through an assessment of uh, the climate risk exposure of all our counterparts. And as part of this uh, process, uh, my department has been tasked uh, with uh, developing uh, uh, an indicator, a rating uh, for uh, climate risk exposure of our counterparts, uh, sovereign counterparts. And this comes uh, the challenge because uh, basically we have been looking, uh, we have been asked to look at uh, climate risk exposure for physical and transition risk for 184 countries around the, the world. And we decided immediately that uh, we didn't want to work with a black box, uh, like many of the different instruments present in the market, but we wanted to have a clear visibility with a simple model to try to understand where the situation is and what the gaps are. Because this needs to be an internal tool that we will use, so we really need to understand the different elements. And now I come to the areas where I think we we are still in the finalization phase of the model. I think we are happy on the structure, but we are trying to fill it better with better data in some areas. And that's where your work will become particularly useful. I start with the physical risk. On the physical risk, we decided that we wanted to use both the concept of acute and chronic risk and also integrate adaptation. We have evolved the model in order to account for monetary losses related to acute chronic events, events and then uh, adjust for adaptation. And the area on the acute part, uh, it's very, while uh, somehow the data on uh, events are there, the monetary loss associated to events, all the database existing have a huge missing data. And this is uh, one area where we think that uh, much more work uh, should be going. On the chronic part, uh, um, it's all often uh, ignored in uh, the various existing models, and there we have been developing a more eclectic ap approach, but uh, that's also one area where we think that uh, more work uh, and uh, more conceptual work uh, should go. In terms of uh, the transition risk, we have, uh, what we have been doing uh, is uh, starting uh, from the CAI identity. We look at uh, the exposure and the mitigation part. We have a model uh, that uh, adds uh, the various components. But there, uh, some of the work that you are doing also in the dashboard uh, seems extremely useful. On the one part, all the work that uh, was just uh, described uh, just uh, simply on the CO2 emissions 
I think having the full picture and the full disaggregation for 184 countries around the world is something complicated. So having everything coming in the same place and with the adjustment on the emissions that you were describing, that's, uh, that's uh, quite uh, um, useful. The other point is uh, on uh, the, um, the, the plans uh, and the targets uh, for uh, different countries, uh, having uh, in a systematic way a reassessment of the, tar of the programs uh, that are in targets uh, that uh, tend to be differentiated and uh, a reassessment, a schematization uh, that makes uh, them more comparable is something uh, quite, uh, quite uh, useful for us. So these are just a few ideas. I may come back with other ideas on areas of development, but I just wanted to pass the message that even for, for, for institutions that need to use for their own purpose, the, an assessment of exposure to climate risk of sovereigns, I think having a standardized databases that cover the full spectrum of countries in a, a systematic way and comparable way is crucial. And particularly the areas that I was mentioning would be extremely interesting for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for this strong plea for a consistent and coherent database who, uh, to feed your models, which is really important if you want to be able to provide policy advice. Uh, thank you for bringing this to the conversation. Let me turn to Rina. Uh, Rina, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm making this important work on climate monitoring. And we had an excellent bilateral meeting with IMF colleagues earlier this week on the global set of climate change statistics and indicators. And we also had a meeting some months ago with the IMF on this very impressive um, dashboard. So congratulations to all of you for that. Um, the main priority for UNSD is to encourage the implementation of the global set of climate change statistics and indicators in countries. This was mandated by the Statistical Commission in 2016. And the global set provides a comprehensive statistical framework with underlying statistics of 50 indicators, as well as metadata designed to support countries in preparing their own national sets of climate change statistics and indicators according to their individual concerns, priorities, and resources. So this is like the bottom-up approach. I think what we were just talking about, you know, the global versus the national, so I think this is really helpful. It will support the implementation of the enhanced transparency framework and the global stocktake of the Paris Agreement, as well as climate-related SDG indicators. Uh, UNST has developed this global set in collaboration with the UN Africa C and our expert group on environmental statistics. And the global set is structured according to the framework for the development of environmental statistics and the five areas of the IPCC framework, that is the drivers, impacts, vulnerability, mitigation, and adaptation. And we've also included relevant the Paris Agreement, uh, decisions under the Katowice package, as well as related SDGs and send different indicators. And these are all included to strengthen the link between policy. The draft global set went through an extensive global consultation this year, to which 86 countries from all regions provided an assessment on the relevance, methodological soundness, and data availability for the indicators and statistics. We also received inputs from 25 agencies, including OECD, the World Bank, and the National Energy Agency, the IMF, amongst others. And we really thank everyone for their very useful contributions. These results were discussed at our recent eighth meeting of the expert group on environmental statistics after a lot of discussion in groups um, and plenary discussions recommended that this global set be submitted to the 53rd session of the system 2022 for adoption. Based on the results of the global consultation, uh, we will continue to work very closely with UNFCCC to uh, develop implementation guidelines for the global set, to promote bridging the gap between policy and statistics and uh, between national statistical offices and climate change reporting agencies at the national level. Because from our global consultation, we actually learned a lot about the relationship at the national level between the NSOs and the focal points of 
We'll also collaborate on capacity development with support from all our regional partners, including the regional commissions and other development partners. As statisticians, we strongly encourage NSOs to continue to strengthen their collaboration with the UNFCCC focal points and continue to be more involved in the preparation of data submissions to the UNFCCC and for supporting the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We also hope that the global set will facilitate harmonization and cross fertilization across all levels by promoting complementarity with other regional, national, or specialized sets of indicators. For example, as Natalie said from the OECD, there's very um, you know, clear linkages to, to the global set, and we also have done that for in, in our set to all possible sources. Thank you. Thank you, Rina, and thank you. For bringing in the framework of the SDG and the importance of setting metadata uh, among us so that we know what we're talking about. I think this is essential and it covers what the others have been saying. So thank you for bringing this to conversation. Now, let me turn to our last uh, but not least, Fabio. You have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for, for the invitation uh, to speak in this panel. So it's a pleasure to be here. And congratulations. I want to join the other panelists to congratulate Gabriel and statistics on the on the dashboard. Um, Gabriel and I have been comparing notes and exchange views and trying to work together for a while on, on this topic. So it is really a great product that you guys have put together. And hopefully that would feed into some other data work stream that is done at, at the international level. Um, so let, let me start maybe. So I come from a different angle, if you want, from this. I work in the financial stability world, uh, cover sustainable finance market. So perhaps one way to think about it is like what framework uh, do we have in mind and what role data play, right? So we publish a note in the climate note series here at the IMF trying to think about it, what we call the climate information architecture. And there are three legs to that. There is the climate data. And so the need for robust, uh, high quality, comparable, or uh, consistent data so that you can actually do exactly what you guys are doing in the dashboard, right? Think about cross-border issues. The second leg of that is uh, classification slash taxonomies. Um, that's essentially having common language when we think about uh, sustainable finance and uh, make sure that there is a link between financial product and ultimately objective as they relate to sustainability. And then the third leg has to do with disclosure, financial disclosure. Uh, in some of these, in these three different legs, there's been quite a bit of progress going into COP26, right? So there's a lot of work done on data. The dashboard is a good example. Uh, I'll mention the NGFS work in a second uh, on, on climate data gaps. I think on the disclosure as well, there's been quite a bit of work. It's particularly led by the AFRS Foundation, uh, setting up a new sustainability board and having disclosure, uh, sustainability, sustainable disclosure that might actually help inform investor and possibly link uh, the direction of investment to actual uh, uh, investment objectives. Right? So the issue of metrics and targets that can be actually be verified and by investor. I think where the more work needs to be done is on the taxonomy and classification. That's where I think the world is a little bit uh, fragmented across different jurisdictions within advanced economy, so the European taxonomy, European Commission approach, for example, vis-a-vis -vis other jurisdictions like the US where there's no public taxonomy, but there are 200 plus of this classification. So clearly there's a need for convergence there, but also between advanced economy and emerging markets, right? Emerging markets, the transition issue is much more pressing than perhaps in some of the advanced economies. Now, data do play an important role here. So suppose magically you move to a world where you you have one disclosure adopted by everyone, one classification. You still need to do work on the data. You still need high quality data, comparable, consistent data. And just to give an example, we had the latest global financial stability report. We look at the role that private finance, particularly the investment fund sector, can play in fostering a transition to a green economy. And we try to get a sense of like, what are the benefits of these flows, right? Those are increase of funding into these green funds or environmental funds seems to actually have an impact in terms of issuance of green instruments. Uh, they have an impact on like investor stewardship, so increased resolution in favor of climate. Perhaps they are less uh, runny, these investors. So from a financial stability perspective, they are not less responsive to the ups and downs of prices, they have a medium-term objective. But we also find that what drives really inflows into this fund is the label, 
So after you and you control for a bunch of stuff like ratings, performance, past performance, and so on, still labels matter. Still, investors are attracted by a climate label, an environmental label. So that underscore again highlight the importance of data. They have good quality data to make sure that there is no greenwashing. And in fact, what is it? Investing into something that has a specific label is then supported by by data. Now, one last point is. I co-chair with DCB uh, and Network for Green the Financial System works in called bridging the data gap, right? And this is exactly the idea of identifying data needs, identify data availability, implicitly getting the data gaps. And so how do we close those data gaps? And we built it around this idea of repository, and you can think of it as a catalog where we match again, the data needs uh, with the data availability. We have identified six stakeholder categories based on these use cases. Uh, and, and then try to match them. And I think that data, the dashboard that Gabrielle presented actually can play, can play an important role, will play an important role in terms of like identify some of the data. So I, I think I'm very, I'm very glad to have been working with Gabrielle on this. So I think what the work has been done here can fit there. Now, what, what is the, a couple of like maybe data challenges? And this is thinking about uh, forward looking work that we, we can do together. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of, it's a crowded landscape, right? So there's a lot of work, so there's a, a pressing need for coordination of effort to avoid overlaps. But in terms of data challenges, just speaking about data, one is that the largest data gap seems to be occurred for forward-looking data. So emission pathways, targets, and those are crucial. Again, targets is the only way to move forward in some sense, right? Uh, to judge where uh, money is going. The second one is limited availability and granularity of carbon data, for example, scope three emission, as well as the geographical location of data. Think about transition risk, for example, right? Where assets are, where projects are. The third point, obviously stakeholders are calling for assurance about the quality of data. That goes back to my initial point. And so verification, audit mechanism, as well as improving data accessibility. And that's very clear when you look at from a corporate standpoint and the supply data, supply chain, right? When they have to have this whole long supply chain in like different choke points in terms of data. So finally, an important point, I think it's also try to not make the perfect, the, uh, to strike for perfection. We, there are also some data out there, and in some use cases, uh, we can actually can work with aggregate data. So granularity of data, obviously, that's the first best, but uh, we don't want perfection to become uh, the enemy, uh, the, the enemy uh, uh, in terms of like the work we're doing here. And so using and leverage what's in the private sector in terms of like open source data collection, for example, technology like machine learning technique, they all can play a role in collecting scattered information, decision useful information in a structured way. And to that extent, I think the dashboard has, has, is playing a, a, a really crucial role uh, along these dimensions. Many thanks, Fabio. Many thanks for bringing uh, the, uh, the uh, issue of uh, financial disclosure, which is really important, the private sector potential database that exists there and the machine learning. I think those are, are certainly something that uh, all the uh, panelists uh, are exploring in, in some in some way. Uh, I have a number of questions, but let me let me turn to the question in the chat because we're having a lot of uh, of uh, questions that uh, are of great interest. So let me start uh, randomly. Uh, there is a, a need for broadly harmonizing definition, obviously, and to enhance comparability. And with the explosion of database and indicators, the different international organization, country cannot keep up with checking what their country data are correctly included in different database. So how are you working with NSO to check country data? And maybe that's a question for uh, you, Natalie, and go we'll back, Natalie. Thank you, Louis Marc. I, I tried to uh, insert a, a line or two very quickly in uh, in the chat, but um, that's a very relevant question. And uh, at the OECD, actually, we have a very decentralized process where all the data are validated by the countries uh, themselves before they are published and become official uh, data in the public domain. So our system of uh, committees and uh, working group all have uh, respective uh, indicators and, um, and data sets and methodological uh, work that is uh, going through the experts from different places around uh, the different ministries. And uh, this is through this process that uh, we can be sure that countries are, are in agreement with, uh, with what we published. Uh, of course, when we have new methodology, 
uh, it's not only the underlying data that needs to be uh, validated, but uh, also the methodology and what the uh, new indicator would look like, as well as how we propose to interpret it and accompany it with uh, other uh, relevant information that uh, that would complement the the information. So this is a um, this is a process that uh, that we value a lot because uh, we feel that. Uh, we have a quality control that is uh, that is uh, extra good with uh, with this close relationship with the NSOs and uh, and uh, different uh, line ministries across countries. Thank you, Natalie. And maybe ask Stefan. I know he had put something in the chat, but maybe he wants to compliment on the same question. Stefan, you have the floor. Yes. Maybe very briefly, just to say that I think what's really needed is to harmonize the the definitions that we're using and to make sure when we publish the data, the definition and the methodology is really, really clear. And to me, it's particularly important on the risk aspects. Uh, there are very different groups uh, doing some risk assessments. And it's not only a question of, of technical uncertainty and scientific uncertainty, but there are questions of definition. What do you include? Are you only valuing things at the, the, the prices before the disaster or the prices after the disaster? Do you include loss of value added? How do you include the impact on poor people, which might not be very visible in, in GDP and other aggregated statistics because they are so poor, but a lot of the welfare impact is on them. So I don't think we'll uh, anytime soon have one definition that we all say this is the definition of risk, but we really need when we publish those numbers to, to clarify what it is, because if you're looking at how those numbers are used. Um, I mean, sometimes numbers are compared while they are just measuring different things. Uh, so to, to me, the, the priority is really in this, uh, is in this typology definitions, and this is something we should all agree about. And then if, if one dashboard is using one definition and another, another, I think that's fine, provided that the information is, is, uh, is, is well distributed. And same thing with the countries. Uh, they might not have the same way of measuring things, and that's okay provided that people don't just compare numbers which are which are not comparable. So I would really focus on that as a first step for the, the collaboration across organizations and with our country partners, NSOs and, and the others. Thank you, Stefan. Maybe I turn to Deborah who needs a lot of data to feed her model. How does she discriminate with, between all those different sources from countries? Deborah, you have the floor. I think uh, I think uh, that's uh, that's uh, one of uh, the key the key problem uh, that uh, we have been facing is really to find uh, data that are consistently comparable uh, um, across uh, countries, and that's where uh, the work that is being done uh, uh, also in the dashboard, but, but uh, that uh, really really brings uh, brings uh, brings a value on our uh, on our perspective. But in terms of uh, data development, uh, what, uh, what I wanted to mention is, um, are a couple of additional uh, points. One area of uh, full uh, where we are starting to work as well, uh, also working uh, together uh, with uh, Copernicus, is to use uh, satel satellite uh, technologies in order to better, better uh, have uh, a full picture of, uh, of uh, the the climate uh, risk uh, uh, events and uh, and uh, I think that uh, using uh, the new technologies and uh, new uh, new ways of using uh, sat satellite data can be quite useful uh, um, and it's uh, something where we could cooperate uh, going forward. Thank you, Deborah. I am tempted to ask uh, all of you: um, Do you feel that the climate change data that we currently have is sufficiently granular to respond to policy need and to be actionable by policymaker. And if not, what would be your advice to uh, uh, improve that? And maybe I start with uh, Fabio. Well, again, um, I, I think it depends on the use, right? And this goes back to this use case approach. I think there are some cases where some level of aggregation is acceptable, 
and the, bar, the, the marginal value added of going more granular compared to the cost perhaps is not there. There are cases where you need more granularity, right? So if you're doing, for example, I don't know, stress testing analysis um, or risk management purposes for financial institution internally, uh, you need to have granular data, right? You need to have uh, information at the loan level, the financial instrument level. Uh, if you are an investor, you invest in specific uh, green instruments, you don't have a good idea of what you're investing in, right? What's behind the portfolio. Um, but not just on the data itself. So th the answer is, I think it depends on the objective. In some case, you can work with some level of aggregation. In some case, you want very, very ground data. Uh, and again, the point is not to make perfection the enemy of uh, the good in some sense, right? Um, you, you want uh, to find the right balance where, where I, in terms of, of level of aggregation. I, I think there, are te there is technology that allows you to move the frontier, right? So satellite image is a good example. Um, there are situations where some of insurance companies are actually able now to locate where some of project or assets are. They can match those, for example, um, with a specific uh, physical hazard. And then they can come up with financial products that are more tailored to the needs and the exposure of specific uh, institution that they are seeking insurance. So I think those are all optimal. So those are example and improvement that allows essentially start pricing properly financial climate uh, climate risk. I think that that's the objective. The objective is to properly price climate risk as granular as you can being aware of that in some cases, uh, perfection is not possible. So you still need to move forward. It makes use as much as we can with technology that is evolving very rapidly. So satellite images is an example. Another uh, approach is open source, right? Open source allows availability of data with all the complication of co commercial data and so on. Uh, and then finally, the last point is, uh, there is also an added di dimension, which is verification of quality. And I think that that's quite important. So to make sure that the quality of data, but also that the methodology that are being used here, they're not just black box, that it's something that investors can actually understand to properly price climate risk. Thank you, Fabio. Let me turn to Nick. Nick, do you think that we have sufficient granularity for policy needs? Yes, and I, I, I think the question of granularity is important. Uh, just reiterating what I'd said previously, just because the policies that we're talking about in many cases have such narrow incidents that if you don't have that granularity, you can't really assess what's going on. And so, uh, but I agree entirely uh, with Fabio that you don't want to make the ideal the enemy of the good, uh, and you don't need to be granular for the sake of uh, of granularity. You need to find out whether or not this is actually truly important. Uh, I want to come back to another point, though not so much a, a data gap, but sort of a, a, a metadata gap, uh, which been, has been alluded to, but uh, I've only recently become conscious of just how important it is. When I was looking through the papers that were presented yesterday and the literature more generally, just thinking of the number of classification systems that are being used uh, when we're doing these studies. And nobody works with a single data set anymore. You're always working with multiple data sets. Uh, and you're not looking for concordance. We're not looking for perfect mapping between different data sets, but we should all be looking over everybody else's shoulders as we implement revisions to existing systems. Uh, moreover, uh, and I think this is particularly true, you know, with the CPC and the ISIC revisions coming up, we're talking about revising our own uh, recommendations, the CX system, Standard in, uh, uh, International Energy Classification System. But it also relates to some of the points that Fabio was, was saying about using new data sources. Uh, uh, because in many cases, we're doing that, in a, in, we're ending up classifying that data. And in some cases, we're doing it in an ad hoc manner. We're letting the data drive how we classify. But you can get locked in in such cases so that that becomes a data island on its own. And so even if you're doing some of these more ad hoc exercises, you know, we're doing new work related to startups. Well, as I'm doing the work related to startups, I'm thinking, can I match this with patent data? Can I match this with firma, uh, with sectoral data? Can I match this with other kinds of data? And I think all of us need to do that. All of us who have responsibility for implicitly or explicitly be behind some of these classification systems. And so it's a, just a general point that I think we need to be looking over each other's shoulders, learning from each other and thinking, where can I map and where is it just not worth mapping uh, and being cognizant of that fact? Yes, this is a very good point, Nick. And uh, in 
the last revision of the national account and the balance of payment, it was done uh, on their own. Nobody was talking to each other. Now we're doing it uh, in, in collaboration. So that's the first step. And I agree that classification is is really important and can skew your data if you don't have it uh, harmonized. But let me turn to Rina, sitting at the UN, who has many of those portfolio coming in. What? How do you see the uh, the fact the insufficient granularity and the policy need? The floor is yours, Rina. Thank you. I mean, I would basically echo what the colleagues have said. It really depends on what you're what you're you know using it for, and I think. Our level of work is maybe a little bit different, at least for my section. We don't run it in directly with the economic you know, side. But um, from our perspective, I think what's really important is to, you know, ensure, as uh, Nick just said very clearly, you know, the harmonization and cross fertilization with the other um, institutions working working on this. And I think we're also coming from a slightly different perspective with the comment from uh, earlier in the, in the chat about, uh, you know, the possible country data may be conflicting with, you know, international data. We are trying to work with all countries and really, as I said before, from a bottom-up approach. So maybe some of our indicators are a little bit simpler in nature, but then we've also coupled them with the underlying statistics that are needed to compile the indicators. So again, you can look at granularity from that point of view as well to see what you can you know, dig down deeper in terms of uh, classification or disaggregation. But I think, um, you know, what I really like besides is it's the importance of um, uh, working with the country to make sure they can produce the data, that they can, um, the data. We have this experience with the SDG indicators where uh, some of them are so complex that we have dissected them, some of the environment related ones, to, to, and we have shown that some, some of the indicators, you, you need like 17 underlying statistics to produce them. So, you know, again, we're trying to make it a little bit simpler for countries in, in the kind of doing and not make these indicators too sophisticated. There is room for that, and there we highly respect the work of you know, the IMF, the World Bank, and others who focus maybe on the very specialized topics. But I think for us, we're trying to give a sort of overall picture for all countries to find, um, you know, to find their feet in it, you know, so that they can be satisfied as well, that they can see how they can fit in it. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Uh, maybe I turn to Deborah, uh, who has the responsibility of building some economic models. Uh, do you think that uh, we have sufficient granular data to respond to those important policy questions? Now, in terms of, in term of granularity, I think it's a, it's a one of the elements where uh, where we think we have to go more in terms of granularity, but also consistency in granularity of data, and uh, that's uh, that's one of uh, the areas where uh, where we think much more work has to be put together by various institutions. Thank you, Stefan. What is your take? Uh, so it's 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 uh, it's difficult to write a, a wish list because there are so many things. Uh, but I think there is a first question, which is when the tools we have developed um, uh, create a bias when applied to to uh, to climate change. One one example is the GDP numbers we have in many countries might not capture very well the impact of natural disasters on many of the infrastructure services or like housing, for instance, which are critical parts. So we we have. We have issues with some of the data we have, and it's not a, necessarily a granularity problem. It's saying that those data were not developed to be applied to the questions we have now, and so we have to review the methodologies and make sure we're not creating a, a bias. And the, the GDP one is very dear to me, so this is something I, I would I hope we can work on. There is a similar example at the very micro data. So when we do household surveys, uh, we have the income and consumption of the households. We don't see what's going on within the households. And of course, if you're talking about gender or the impact of on the children or elderly, uh, opening this box would be absolutely critical to design better tools. But the last point I wanted to make is, I think the connection of the databases is really where we have the most trouble. So you have a labor force survey 
and you have national accounts, and they don't use the same categories and so on, so you, you can't connect the dots. Uh, and same thing with household level data with like data on the assets. It's very difficult to connect it. And on the, so th there are issues that are purely technical. And on the data, on the household side, there are also issues related to privacy. Uh, I mean, it, connecting all of the data set is really nice, but then you, you, you get to a level of, uh, of knowledge about households that, that might be a problem. So it's not only technical problems, we also have to, to do it well. Uh, but I think it, it really opens a, a whole lot of opportunities for all of us to just collaborate and with NSO and with partners in countries uh, to, to, and I mean, I agree that we need to put something on the table, not wait that we have something perfect, but then use what we have on the table and the interest it creates to build a work program and to improve over time, as we did on poverty metrics maybe 20 years ago. Thank you, Stefan. There's a lot of questions on, on classification. And uh, before I turn to Natalie, let me read one so that uh, she can focus on it. The uh, importance of separately classifying climate change related activity and product in the standard economic classification, I6, CPC, HS are mentioned. Uh, the proposal to separate some activities for climate change mitigation activities are being considered. We draw some support and reservation due to the unavailability and practicability. How can we improve the argument in order to support the mainstreaming climate change issue in the current economic classification? Natalie. That's a $1, one million dollar question. It's, uh, it's extremely challenging. And um, I think that um, this is uh, one area for um, international cooperation, certainly. Um, for instance, in the area of uh, government-related um, uh, climate expenditure, um, there is hardly any data uh, that uh, is available for several countries. Um, what we have is environmental protection data that are general and related to water or waste uh, issues and not specifically uh, related to mitigation or adaptation. Um, and there, there are no uh, agreed methodology on that. And uh, I think that this was also highlighted in, um, in the presentation by, uh, by Gabrielle as uh, one area of, uh, of future work uh, that is uh, immensely uh, important uh, to be able to see uh, what are the needs for countries uh, and, um, and identify if uh, they are um, taking the most of uh, what is available in terms of uh, fiscal space for, for this area. Um, I think that another area where we absolutely need uh, to, uh, to do more work is, um, is look at the hidden exemptions or subsidies or granted benefits uh, that uh, are uh, not necessarily the tax and the subsidy work uh, that uh, the IMF has started to do and the one that is done by other uh, international organization as well as, uh, as the OECD, I think it's really important um, to make sure that firms are disclosing sufficiently the information and, and that we're not missing any uh, items uh, to, uh, uh, to get to a, a proper measurement of uh, what is needed there. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. There's still a lot of question on, on classification and Natalie, you, you referred to the, uh, the uh, comments of Gabriel and his presentation of the dashboard. If he's online, may I ask Gabriel to react to those comments on, on issue and the challenge that classification brings to the setting of database for climate change. Gabriel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Remark. Thank you very much, uh, panelists, uh, for the excellent comments and to those who uh, introduced comments through the chat. Indeed, uh, classification is the elephant in the room uh, for climate change statistics. Uh, our mac current macroeconomic statistics uh, try to put forward a methodology with basically one critical end goal, an end a goal, which is to have a classification and to understand uh, in more detail, we call it granularity, additional breakdown, and so on and so forth, what is going on in the economic and financial, uh, financial activity. 
The problem is that the current classification, the existing classification, was designed uh, decades ago when climate change was not in front of the policymaker, was not in front of the economist. And when we go to a dashboard which serves economists, we have this problem of classification. Classification is going to be there for a while and for years. Uh, in the time, in the for the uh, in the uh, for the time being, in we have to make sure that when we go to micro data to quote uh, Fabio, there is no greenwashing, or when we go to macro data, there is not actually a better uh, look at the country that uh, uh, that uh, should be given the reality. For this, the dashboard does two things before we have a fully harmonized uh, classification with a lot of emphasis on metadata, each indicator is actually very much uh, explained in terms of the methodology, the data sources, and not only what the indicators say, explain, but also what are the shortcomings. We have put this particular emphasis on the shortcomings of the indicators. Metadata is the first uh, transitional element until we get the perfection that will not exist for many years ahead and stay in the good. The second is the glossary. The dashboard have provide a glossary. And actually we try to be as specific as possible what is actually the definition of each indicator. This may be something that when we go to our private data providers and other providers may, uh, may not be there. We give full transparency in order to prevent. But of course, uh, when you see the numbers, when you see the charts, you need to link uh, in our dashboard to the metadata, metadata what is behind the, dash, uh, the, the chart or the number. This is really critical. For example, in environmental, uh, in environmental goods uh, classification, the HS codes that uh, has been one of the questions there. Obviously, we take the UN Comptrade uh, database and we ourselves at the IMF uh, make calculations country per country. It depends on the areas uh, of the environmental world. Sometimes may, we may be overestimating the numbers. And uh, in certain areas, we could even uh, underestimate the numbers. But we do it with one element. As we do it ourselves in the department, in the statistics department, we have comparable data. So when we have overestimated or underestimated a little bit, uh, the information per country, this bias will be across countries because we make sure that uh, um, certainly, um, a statistics is, uh, is, is far from mathematics, far, far, uh, far from algebra, it's just an estimation, and at least we try that the estimation is as close as possible to reality, but also has the same bias across countries. This is, I think, very important when we try to have a global policy agenda. So uh, basically, uh, these comments, I think, uh, uh, I would like also just to take the nice words of uh, 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 Nick Johnston. Let's, uh, let's, let's look at, uh, at each of us. Uh, he said, uh, um, uh, how you said, over our shoulders. Um, I, I think this is what we have to do, and, uh, and uh, a panel like this serves for that. Uh, I would like just to pick up one point from Stefan. Uh, Stefan said, target looks like a very simple thing. Well, this is the target of the country. No, well, this is the target of the country as we interpret the target of the country. So this is a sensitive issue, but we hope that through the dashboard there is a peer pressure in order that there is more transparency about the national determined targets in the, as per Paris Agreement. And actually, we know that uh, we make an estimation. We explain what type of estimation we make in our targets. So it's uh, like uh, we are not simply the, the, uh, taking the data because the data do not exist. Sometimes they are PDF uh, documents from countries provided to the UN. So this is kind of a, of a challenging element, and we try to make, to use the same uh, metric for all countries in order to have the most comparable data. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, let me say that uh, uh, I can no agree much uh, with the comment uh, of one of you, I think not, uh, Fabio, perfection is the enemy of the good. Uh, if we have actually tried to have perfection in the dashboard, we, we would not be would not be live because it's something, uh, a work which is uh, developing, but by, in, by all means, we try, we try to have something close. 
uh, has been uh, mentioned the case of GDP. Well, GDP we, is probably the most believed, strongly believed uh, indicator, and it's a very good indicator, by the way, across countries. But for example, the informal economy is in some countries estimated fully, and in some countries is actually overlooked. So when we look at uh, the GDP level, so we think sometimes, well, uh, this is uh, perfectly comparable. It's not perfectly comparable. So, and the GDP has been there for 80 years at least. So I guess a lot of work is still ahead of us, but important is metadata and clear indication of the way we produce these indicators. And hopefully uh, with the initiatives like uh, the revisions of the ISIC, uh, the CPC, uh, the manuals, uh, the BP, the SNA, and also the new data gap initiative, uh, new uh, uh, G20 data gap initiative will have a further momentum in order to come to comparable and more accurate data uh, across countries related to economic and financial dimensions of climate. Thank you, Remark and colleagues. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, thank you. There's still a lot of comments in the chat, but uh, let me ask to the panel a uh, last question before we close this session. Uh, as you know, we're getting close to the holiday season. It's going to be Thanksgiving next week in the US, but uh, in a month from now, it's going to be the holiday season. And it's time for you to pick a wish for the new year. So if you had to pick one wish of, to close one of the data gap, which one would you choose and why? And you have two minutes. And let me start with Fabio. I think picking from the challenges I mentioned before, uh, if I had to pick one, I would say forward-looking data, right? So thinking of like the TCFD metrics and targets, and for two reasons. I think because forward-looking ability to judge plans and all firms and financial institutions, corporates and financial institutions accountable is the only way to actually get on a path that would take you to a green economy. Uh, but also because from a financial market standpoint, which is more by where, where I work, asset prices are forward looking, right? So the only way for asset prices to actually price climate risk, if you have, again, high quality, comparable, consistent data, that's the only way to make sure that climate risk is actually priced in financial markets and, and private finance can play a role. So both for a pricing perspective, risk management perspective, as well as holding uh, the various stakeholders accountable, I think we, if I could choose, I would pick forward-looking data uh, without a doubt. Very good, thank you, Fabio. Arena, what would you choose? Thank you very much. Um, so, as I had mentioned uh, from the uh, global consultation, at the, the, we received um, a lot of information where, because we made an assessment on data availability for the indicators and statistics. Um, and this refers, as I said before, to nationally produced or nationally owned data. So, um, what we found was the indicators related to GHG emissions have highest data availability. I think that was not such a big surprise. But the finance related indicators in the areas of mitigation and adaptation have the lowest data availability among the 86 countries. So, for us, I would say one of the main data gaps and coming listening, you know, the six uh, last week is to try to close the gap for the um, indicator, the, it's the SDG indicator 13A1, which is the amount provided in US dollars per year in relation to the in collecting organization goal of the commitment. I mean, it's a long one, I'm sorry. Um, so we also have that in our global set, and we found that only four out of the 20 advanced economies have responded that they have national data available. Um, and this indicator is crucially relevant to climate change mitigation policies, measures implemented under the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and SG monitoring, given that developing countries are really the most vulnerable to the impacts and consequences of climate change. And related to this indicator, we also have one of our own. Um, it's in our global set, not the SDGs. It's called climate change funds received. Um, and it's not fully, um, I would say, fleshed out yet. It's a tier three. I didn't mention earlier, we have three tiers in our global set. But this particular indicator is primarily geared towards developing countries. And um, even without full metadata, only four of the 57 developing countries have responded. We have any data at all. And 18% um, of the 
those countries that respond specified that they don't have any. And a couple of other um, important indicators I would consider, and I think Julie has um, alluded to them about uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation um, in terms of government expenditure in relation to GDP. And again, from our quotation, we found uh, that only 12% of the countries have the data for share of climate change mitigation expenditure in relation to GDP, and 11% of the countries have um, data, national data for share of government adaptation expenditure in relation to GDP. So we, I mean, these are a few that I've chosen, but I think they're really, really important dimension. And we very much look forward to continuing collaboration with our key partners, um, such as IMF, OECD, Eurostat, the World Bank, the Economic Commission for Europe, et cetera, to, you know, continue to build on these um, metadata that we already have. And I really appreciate also Gabriel's uh, comment on the importance of metadata and to try to improve data availability for the indicators for, for all countries. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. That's a very comprehensive wish list. Uh, Deborah, what would be your wish? I I leverage on uh, Fabio's request because my first request would have been for dual looking uh, and targets, but given that he will receive this, uh, this uh, Christmas presents and then it will be a public good, I had a second one. <laughs> that is my, my second in the wish list. And is uh, and is uh, actually filling the many country gaps, missing data in terms of uh, monetary loss associated to extreme weather event. I think the databases are there, but the number of missing data in most of the most common databases are huge. And finding a consistent methodology to associate event to the monetary loss generated to the event could be something quite useful. Thank you, Deborah. This is a nice segue to you, Nick. See what you have as your first wish. Uh, on my wish list, well, many, many things. Uh, I'll go beyond one, but just the two. Uh, first one uh, is, in, in picking up from what Stefan had said, I think the household uh, uh, side is, is a big data gap more generally, and it's a big data, data gap for us in terms of end-use data. Uh, we have a great deal of difficulty uh, collecting that information across countries and putting it into a format that, that really allows us to do so in a consistent manner uh, across different end uses and different fuels. And so that's a that's a big big data gap for me that I think would be great to get for Christmas. The second one, uh, and this is a bit looking forward as well, is as we go out, everybody knows the role of electricity of power in our energy mix is just going to increase. We have great data on the mix, the generation mix of different fuels that go into power. Uh, where we don't have great data is on the, the characteristics of the grid in terms of flexibility and security. Data that we can pair across countries, because that to me is, you know, one of the key indicators of the extent to which all of these wonderful targets that we're putting in place can be met, because we're going to be putting huge pressure on the grid. But we don't have good ways of measuring that in a consistent manner and I, for Christmas, and it's something I've thought about and failed many times, I would like somebody to answer how we should, how we can address that uh, that problem going forward. That's an excellent wish. I'm I'm always puzzled of how we're going to manage to have all those electric cars and without extending the grid. Uh, Natalie, what would be your wish? Actually, I have two that have not been mentioned yet. So, uh, the first one uh, would be to have uh, better data on jobs uh, that are at risk and. Um, across sectors. Uh, I think that uh, by knowing which sectors, which regions uh, there are risk uh, for the labor market would really help us to adjust public policies uh, so that uh, we can prevent some of the green uh, washing uh, of uh, the impact of a transition and make sure that we have uh, policies that are uh, fair in that respect. Um, so this would serve us quite a lot in the narrative. And then the second wish I have uh, would be to have um, better data measuring uh, lifestyle, uh, behavioral data. And um, I'm thinking here particularly um, the voice of the youth that is uh, um, higher and higher. And um, 
public opinion, observatories of lifestyle, uh, behavioral um, considerations um, are not developed enough and would certainly help us uh, to maneuver in the political economy of reform that is needed for net zero. Uh, those are two very good, very, very good wishes. Uh, Stefan, you have the last wish. Oh, that's that's pretty nice, and I really hope that you have kept track of, of this list because I think it's a it's a it's a really interesting list that we should have somewhere uh, published. And I mean, it's a basic of a of a work program, right? Uh, so before adding data, I just wanted to mention that we should also help the people who have the data to make it public for free and for all. I mean, we're all working under constraints, financial or legal constraints in terms of, of this data. And I think if the if the G20 work could maybe also look at that and how governments can make sure all of the data that exists is available to improve decision making, those are public goods. And I think there is a big potential there. Um, I also wanted to mention to Nick that uh, please get in touch because on the household data, we're trying to work on harmonizing uh, energy use across countries. All household surveys are different. We're doing this work, very happy to share uh, whatever we have. Um, and in terms of what I would add, I mean, first on everything forward looking, I think we need a better um, uh, way of communicating the uncertainty. As soon as you're looking in the future, there is no one possible future. And every time we're, we're producing forecasts, I think we're hiding a very important dimension of decision making, which is the uncertainty and how to make sure the decision we make are robust to different possible futures. So I think there is a risk of making people think we know more than we do when we have just one, one projection. And the, and the last point is, to me, speaking from World Bank side, I think we're not only interesting, interested in what is the impact, but on who is feeling the impact. And that's all about the connection between the, the macro parts and the national accounts and so on, and the household data. So the, to me, that would be the, the priority is to be able to say more about who is experiencing uh, the, the impacts of whatever we do, so that we can get better at protecting the poor and we can manage better the political economy. Thank you, Stefan. You'll be pleased to hear that uh, one of the recommendations of the uh, next uh, data gap initiative of G20 is exactly to ensure that there's dissemination of microdata uh, across the country. As you know, this is very complicated because it, it, uh, it has legal, legal implication and country specific implication, but uh, at least it's, it's there as, as a wish as well. So your wish is already on the list. So before we end this session, uh, the team wants to share a, a, a short survey to get our participation views on uh, some question. So uh, the trick is to uh, go to uh, www.menti.com and to use the code that you see on the screen, 30206750. So get on your phone and that was an obvious uh, answer. I think the participants are in agreement with uh, with the panelists that uh, we need more data and we also need different type of data. Uh, so there's no big surprise. Very good. And the next question.
We don't hear we don't hear you, Limac. Okay, so it seems that we have emission mitigation adaptation for looking. Let's move to the next question. Well, it seems that there's a great conversion towards classification, granularity, standards, methodology, data, political will is, is there very strongly, um, definitions. So I think that summarized quite nicely uh, some of the discussion that we had this morning. Uh, so let me now end this this session. I would like, first of all, to thank profusely my panelists for the interesting discussion and their enthusiasm uh, towards the topic uh, and also the virtual audience for their participation. I think this was a very rich, a very rich session. Uh, we have still a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, I'm reassured to see that there's a lot of conversion on objective uh, between the organization that are represented here uh, and and the others that are not uh, and and that's that's food for thought for for the future so thank you very much uh, the next session will start at 1:30 washington time uh, after the lunch break and it will fe feature another high level panel discussion this time on the role of climate change and related statistics in the informing decision making and the public so it which is a very nice segue from this this session i would like finally to remind everyone that the keynote speech from professor yuan rockstrom will start at 3:15 and will be followed by the one-on-one -on -one discussion with the imf managing director kristalina georgieva so with that again thanks to my panel thanks to uh, Gabriel and his team for a very nice presentation and very nice videos and I wish you well. Cheers all.